This lecture is going to be um, about pricing. Um, what it is is probably the, the most technical <clears throat> uh, lecture that you would you would get. Um, it is also probably one of the ones where, uh, relative to what I could talk about, um, I'm cutting out an enormous amount. Um, it's usually a complicated issue um, that um, is a course in and of itself. Uh, so what we're going to do is try to cover the key points, and I'm going to link it back to some of the discussions that we've had before. Um, really, what's what's critical here, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, is how the pricing aligns with the underlying uh, segmentation, targeting, and positioning uh, components of uh, the farm strategy. So what we'll end up doing is really trying to link this to uh, the characteristics of the underlying segment, the willingness to pay, um, and also the nature of the positioning. But while there's an enormous amount of kind of rhythm and melody and myth around pricing, um, it's really good to kind of stick with the fundamental economics associated with pricing structures because um, 99 times out of 100, um, these will be the things that that really do drive um, uh, how it is you do the pricing and what threats there are to the pricing structures that you have available to you. Uh, and this is also uh, critical in terms of the nature of that a posteriori behavioral type of segmentation logic that we've discussed before. Um, it's, you know, price is a critical component of that um, and getting the underlying pricing structure right is, is really quite important. Um, also, as you, as you look across different markets, um, be they culturally linked or literally just structurally linked to um, uh, different levels of demand or different segment structures, um, you, you really do have the problem of, of spillover when the pricing gets out of whack. Uh, the other aspect of this, which I think is important, is to keep in mind that, that uh, in many cases, pricing becomes something of an afterthought in the marketing strategy of many organizations. So what happens is they do all of their other background work. They look at the, they look at the, the, the brand and the imaging and a host of other things, um, and then look on the pricing as fundamentally something which is meant to kind of be a cost plus markup. Um, that isn't a terribly sophisticated way to think about things. Um, so we're gonna to try to avoid getting caught up in that logic. So when you look at pricing on an international basis, what you see is you see both a level of complexity and a level of simplicity. Um, the complexity arises because there are large numbers of factors which affect pricing decisions. Um, and we'll talk about some of those. Um, the simplicity is due to the fact that price can actually be changed much more easily. In other words, it's a lot easier to change the price uh, than it is to change the uh, product image that you've invested um, uh, so long and hard in. It's also much more uh, difficult, for example, to change distribution structures um, or to change um, uh, the underlying kind of design characteristics of the product. So it does have that simplicity. Um, it, it also is uh, a, a factor that you have to kind of consider the optimal price for individual products as well as different products across the product line. Um, so if you go back to the branding discussions that we had and you're looking at something like a, a branded house or a house of brands, um, there are certain implications which follow from those types of structures. Um, so for example, a house of brand structure in many cases actually has this kind of segmentation and pricing component attached to it. But there, there are sort of qualitative and, and quantitative uh, components of pricing. Um, the quantitative components really do uh, drive a lot. Uh, and in fact, as I said before, probably drive a significant amount of what it is that you do. Um, there are then kind of qualitative components, which are related to kind of the psychology 
um, and, and potentially strategic factors. Um, you hear a lot of these types of things about, well, you know, should products end in 0.99 or 0.95, you know, and are all these kind of little pricing tricks um, that, you, that you read about in, in sort of the popular press and sort of pop psychology. Um, these can matter a little bit, um, but potentially they don't necessarily matter all that much um, and, and can be diluted very quickly. You know, so for example, there, there is a well-known anchoring type of effect, which causes uh, firms to put high priced items uh, early in the consumer kind of interaction. Uh, for example, if you looked at a catalog or a website, they don't put the lowest priced items first. They'll typically put the higher priced items first. This is a classic kind of anchoring and positioning type of logic. Um, but th that assumes, of course, that the individual goes through the catalog in a certain sort of way. Um, so in stylized experiments, you might actually find that there's an anchoring effect associated with you know, anchoring a person on early high prices. So show them the more expensive items first and then the less expensive items next. But uh, that may not be the way that the individual actually goes through the catalog. For example, what if they go through the catalog backwards uh, or they randomly kind of leaf through it? Um, all of these types of logics kind of kind of disappear quite quickly, uh, which is one of the reasons why, I, why you know, other than some kind of uh, obvious thing such as kind of evil numbers in various cultures, it, it's kind of hard to make an argument that that these psychological factors are are materially dominant um, over long periods of time. Uh, but strategic factors may matter um, that your pricing isn't going to be independent of your competitive positioning, um, it's not going to be independent uh, of uh, potentially the evolution of entry of competitors. All of those factors would come in, come in into it. While they're, they're noted as qualitative components, they actually can be quantitatively modeled. Um, it's just very complex to do it. And then the multinational dimension adds in all sorts of complexity, but, but one of the biggest complexities associated with transfer pricing and, and that is transfer pricing being the internal price um, associated with the passing of the product from one uh, stage of the value chain to another stage. So, so it could be transfer internally, or it could be transfer between uh, you and your distributor. Um, and and this, this is a legal problem as well as a, a strategic problem. From a strategic standpoint, it, it ultimately leads to a question around, okay, who controls the pricing? Uh, most most uh, uh, legal jurisdictions don't let the manufacturer determine the final price. Um, generally speaking, that's considered to be price fixing and it's considered to be illegal. Um, but the, the question of course is they do have recommended prices um, and there are also issues related with the nature of the tax liabilities. And I'll come back to all of that um, in terms of the nature of sort of kind of how you can minimize the tax liabilities. And in the case of a lot of the uh, transfer pricing, when it's internal to the firm, the question of course is who determines what the price is. So if I'm exclusively selling my own product to my own distribu dis distribution structure, which I own as well, um, the most obvious thing is that I would overcharge uh, in high tax distributions and undercharge in low tax uh, 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 institutional structures um, or, or um, uh, areas. Um, but generally that's, that's also viewed as, as illegal. Um, and so you have all sorts of kind of technical issues which, which arise. So let's talk about some of the basics. Um, this this is, should not be new to anybody. Um, but but from a, a general standpoint, you have your underlying cost factors, these being um, both the fixed and variable costs, but also anticipated costs associated with it. Um, demand factors, which are obviously things like the elasticity of the demand, um, the cross elasticity uh, related to products, and the value, which is the willingness to pay. And I'm going to come back to this in, in a second. Um, you have the competitive factors, which are the structure of competition, barriers to entry, all of this in things like Porter's Five Forces. And then you have all sorts of localized factors, such as 
um, uh, the availability of technology and, and, and so on down the line. In the local environment, you have various types of trade factors, such as power in the channels of distribution, the existence of gray markets, um, you know, uh, erosion of margins, what would be associated margins, what things are legal or illegal within, within certain types of structures. Most jurisdictions obviously view um, discrimination, collusion, and, and predatory pricing as bad. Um, but the question, of course, is enforcement associated with uh, those types of activities. You then kind of have the firm's factors, which lead to the ultimate pricing decisions, which are an interaction of all of these types of things, but take into effect those strategic factors, such as the segmentation structure that exists in the market, what are the target markets, um, uh, what's the product positioning, you know, for example, is it a luxury product or an everyday product, um, and also what the objectives of the pricing are. Um, the pricing is not only kind of the, the, the thing which ultimately would drive revenue, but it's also something which is, is linked to these other factors. And I'll come back to that um, in a minute. So, so like any market, the pricing decisions associated with what's in that market will actually have an impact on the nature of, of the evolution of uh, the price associated with that. And there are lots of things related, for example, to the complementarity of various product structures and, and a number of other different types of things. So when you look at the customer side of this, um, you're really looking at kind of, well, what's the feasibility of, you know, what, what's the range into which you could actually price? Now, some of this, of course, is, is, again, very simple economics in the sense that it's related to the structure, the economic structure of the market. In other words, are there substitutes out there? All right. Uh, the more substitutes, okay, the higher um, the price elasticity. Um, how close are those substitutes, right? So there could be substitutes, but they may not necessarily be absolutely kind of perfectly substitutable. Um, again, that has an impact on the, on the price elasticity of demand. Uh, the degree of necessity, um, you know, th this is a kind of classic example associated with, with scarcity. Uh, companies like Zara are very good at this. Uh, Zara uh, generates a, uh, a scarcity in the sense that um, once a product is gone, um, it generally doesn't restock that uh, that that product line. Um, what that means is that means that that if you don't get it when it's available, uh, you lose the opportunity to purchase it. Um, so there's a degree of associated with uh, necessity in terms of sort of kind of getting getting the item. Um, the time period uh, that's spent considering uh, the product. So the longer um, you work on consideration, um, the more in-depth the search, um, generally speaking, that lead that's related to uh, a lower effective uh, uh, price feasibility range, which is linked to the higher uh, price elasticity demand. And then the proportion of income spent on the good. Um, you know, the higher the proportion of income spent, again, generally speaking, the more sensitive price is going to be. Now, if you look at all of these and you talk about these within, within an international context, is there's no indication that these things have to be the same from market to market, okay? Um, the degree of necessity may be culturally related or may be related to demographics, but things like the closeness of the substitutes uh, or the pricing, uh, the, the, the minimum price that you could kind of charge given your underlying cost structure relative to the underlying income of the individual. Um, you know, the nature of search, which is which would also be related to um, such as th things like the, the overall income. In other words, the higher the value of time, the less the likelihood an individual is going to search. So what this means is it means that, that you actually have a feasible price range, you know, so, so it isn't like you, you see when you're doing kind of a simple economics exercise and you sort of say, okay, well, what's the optimal price here? Well, you can estimate, you know, what might be an optimal price in, in certain stylized examples. But the problem is that, that in reality, you end up with a set of circumstances where you're looking at a minimum price range. So the minimum price range obviously being linked to the underlying cost. 
But there's also an issue associated in most companies where it isn't just an issue of covering the underlying cost. It's actually an issue of making a contribution to the fixed cost of the development of the product as well, um, which means that there's always going to be some sort of kind of rate of return that's going to be a minimum rate of return that, um, uh, that the company would expect. Then there are things like, you know, the customer's incentive to buy, which are linked to fundamentally the willingness to pay. And I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Um, communications, which might raise uh, the perceived value. Um, again, this is the might be the advertising effect, the promotion effect. And then uh, competition. In, in other words, all the substitutable stuff over here. So, so the substitutable stuff pushes this down. The cost pushes this up. Right. Um, and obviously the customer's willingness to pay and customer demand also would have an impact on sort of kind of moving this up and down. So, so you could see going through an exercise which would, which would really be looking at um, the, all of these things as kind of components of the pricing. Um, again, that's kind of fairly, you know, uh, uh, fairly, uh, fairly obvious. What's more interesting is when you start to look at the willingness to pay. Okay, so this is an example that I've given you before, right? Um, these are athletic shoes, right? So this is, the, this is the, the customer demand model for three segments, the price segment, the brand segment, the ethical segment, which I gave you in prior lecture. Um, and, and what you have here is the impact of each of these components of the product linking it to the overall demand. So, so this model here effectively is saying, what's the probability that the individual would purchase a product which has a specific mix of functional attributes, a specific mix of social attributes, you know, is one of the, one of the brands, obviously it can't be all of the brands, um, where it might be produced, although we can ignore that for the short term. And then obviously the price elasticity. So a highly price elastic segment here, fairly price elastic segment here, and a price inelastic segment here. Okay. Now, the, this is kind of where the interesting aspect of this comes. In, in other words, you can work your way back from these numbers here, right? So these numbers are, are the effect, the impact on the probability of purchase, right? But I can utilize that to estimate the value of each of these components, right? So, so I know how sensitive the individual is to price and I know how sensitive they are to fit. So I can look at the ratio of these items and actually get a dollarized value for fit and a dollarized value for child labor and a dollarized value for the minimum wage. And I could ask the question, okay, well, if I provide a product of a spurt type, what was the what is the price that I might be able to offer that in the market? Or what's known as the customer's willingness to pay. Okay. So if I if I offer a very light shoe with high reflectivity or uh, with, with high reflectivity, because that's it's a negative effect, which has very good fit characteristics, right? Um, and you know, might let's say let's say be be moderately good. So it has a little bit of an impact here. Okay, um, how how much would would this price people in this price segment be willing to pay for this? So so what I've given you here is I've given you this very general one. I can actually take this even further. In other words, I could break this down by personal characteristics. So so this is just the general demand, but I could actually do this. Um, for every single individual. So I could estimate this, right? Now, what we've done over here, just to show you is, is to sort of say, okay, well, suppose what I did is I did that just for the, for the average product. How would this break down? And the answer is I can see what percent of the value is attached to what component, right? So all of the, this, this here should add up to, 100%, okay, we've added price in as a component of this, okay, so you could abstract from price if you wanted to. 
Um, and, and, the, and if you looked at this, the interesting aspect of this, of course, is that in the price segment, what, what, what drives the, the, the percent of the value that the customer attributes to the product? Well, it's, it's, it's basically driven by the price, but the brand comes in quite heavily. Right? If I look in the brand segment, the brand, even though this is the brand segment, 37% <clears throat> of the value is on the brand, 45% is on the functional attributes. And in the ethical case, the brand is actually a negative. So it actually reduces. If you notice, this would then be 143%. And then you take the 43% out. Um, price still matters, right? As a percent of the value. The interesting thing is, even though this is the ethical segment, the social components actually don't add as much as you would expect them to add. More than they do here. And certainly here where they have no value whatsoever. Okay, but effectively what I can do with this is I can come up with my pricing strategy associated with this. And one of the things that's interesting here is that if you think that you could extract a lot of value from the, on, in terms of the price, from the social attributes, from the ethical segment, the answer to that question is it doesn't appear to be that, that, that that's possible. They are still much, much more affected by the functional attributes. It's just relatively speaking, this category puts more value on the ethical attributes than the others. And then I could turn around and say, okay, well, where are these people located? And this is the, I gave you this example before, okay? Um, and I can look at each of these components as well and then see how this relates to the different aspects of this. The, the main point of this is, is I can take this model here, right? And estimate the value of each of the underlying attributes. And, and essentially these are what are known as hedonic prices. So I could have a price for shock absorption, a price for weight, price for ankle support, price for durability. And in some cases this would be, the price for durability would effectively be zero here. But for the brand in the ethical segment, it's actually would, would be would not be a, a you know a, a, an, an insignificant component of what it is that the customer has, right? So so this willingness to pay and the willingness to pay for what, okay, is actually related directly to the segment, and it's directly related to these types of models here. So I can decompose this. So if we go back to that example of the perceptual maps that we, we, we showed in some of the last lectures, if you, you, you literally could price the components of those perceptual maps if you did the, uh, the modeling correctly. Um, and, and many companies do this, to be perfectly honest. So BMW, Mercedes, uh, Ford, Chevrolet, uh, Peugeot, they actually all would have pricing models where they would price the components of the car. And this is why they, they're, they're able to say, okay, well, what we're gonna do is we're going to offer a luxury package or we're going to offer a uh, technology package for the automobile. And here's how much that technology package is going to cost. And, and one of the things that, that comes from this is that it may be that the, those things are usually overpriced. Um, and, and they're usually overpriced as bundles. And part of the reason is what they're doing is they're aggregating these, they're aggregating components of these up to try and maximize the value that the customer would get from those components. Um, so you can, you can look at this and, and, and see kind of very unique aspects of this. Now, there are also the psychological aspects. And, and again, I, I downplay these a little bit, but, but some of these do have some value. Um, the, the, the most obvious of these is what's known as reference pricing. Um, in this case, you have customer expectations about price levels, um, and those have um, an impact on the comparison base. Um, in other words, the, the value that a customer puts on a product is not necessarily going to just be related to the functionality of that product, right? And that's exactly what this shows, right? Um, the, the functionality here is not necessarily the largest component, right? So, so uh, you can affect that by affecting co components of this, okay? The, so, so this affects the customer, but for the multinational in many cases, and I'll, I'll show some examples, um, setting the first pricing structure 
allows the multinational to justify pricing in other in other countries. So, so you have two two aspects of the reference price. One aspect of the reference price is individuals comparing product product A to product B, um, and what you want to do is 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 to potentially affect. Let's say your product B, you want you want to affect them by the pricing of product A. So you if you have if you're um, the producer of both product A and product B, you might put product A in the market and not expect it to generate any real market share. But what you're doing is you're setting a reference price again so that product B generates um, the profitability for your firm. If product A is your competitor's product and it's the first product in the market, it may actually set the reference price. And in those sets of circumstances, you, you, you're essentially working against whatever that initial reference is. Um, you know, and, and sometimes individuals talk about, you know, what's the fair price for this product type of thing. But in many cases, it's really related to, the, to, to what's known as the referent. Um, but for the multinational, one of the really more important aspects of this is that, that it, it sets the subsequent pricing strategies in other countries. Uh, part of this is regulatory. And that is that if it, if it starts, for example, by selling the product at a very low price in the United Kingdom, and then when they move to France or Germany, they rack the price up by 30 or 40%, um, rest assured that what will end up happening is that you'll, you'll, you'll get scrutiny associated with why are those prices so significantly different. You also have price quality signaling. Um, th there's a lot which is said on this, which is an argument that says, well, demand curves don't always slope down. Um, the, the answer to that question is, given quality, demand curves always do slow, slope down. Um, but if you think about uh, uh, price quality signaling, a lot of that, again, relates back to the underlying attributes. Um, so if, if the price is signaling um, higher quality, there is a belief that hopefully can be justified to some degree that that higher pricing is, is linked to some aspects of the nature of the attributes. Okay, so if, if I buy, uh, you know, an original Hermes Birkin bag, the expectation is that the quality of that bag is going to be a lot higher given the nature of the pricing because the pricing reflects aspects of the nature of the production of that item uh, and also the quality of the leather and so on that line and the scarcity of the product. So, there, so, so there's a, a, an intangible component to that. Um, but the other aspect of this is that too low a price can sometimes have a negative effect on, on, on perceptions because individuals will also infer the floor um, associated with the production of a product, which means that if it's perceived to be very low, then the question the customer may be asking is related to the underlying cost. So, so, so the price quality signaling isn't just this, this blind you know, consumers are a bit like lemmings and what they'll do is they'll simply look at the price and infer quality. Um, there, there are quite complicated underlying circumstances in which that ends up being stable kind of as an economic equilibrium. Um, but fundamentally there's a, there's, there, there is some other kind of aspect of the signaling associated with this, which is important. Uh, you have things like price endings, uh, odd price endings, for example. Um, if you, one of the things that's quite interesting about this is in, in a number of countries, Australia being the most obvious, um, uh, Australia does no, no longer has pennies, which means that if you see a product which is priced at $4.99, when you check out at the register, they actually charge you $5. And when you see a product which is um, at $4.96, they charge you $4.95. Okay, so in one case they run up, in the other case they round down. Um, and, and, and one of the questions is, well, why do companies still persist with a pricing of $4.99 when they're actually going to charge you $5? And, and, the, and the view to that is that there is a psychological jump associated with these numbers as opposed to those numbers. Okay, um, and, and there is some degree associated with um, with this logic. But the question is, is how persistent is it in terms of it? In this situation here, you know, is the demand really so much larger 
when you charge one penny less. All right. Um, but it is a persistent belief that 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 individuals will respond to these different types of sort of kind of um, odd or even number pricing. Um, and the other aspect of this is that there are price cues. Um, it, there are things like guarantees, price matching, everyday low prices. For example, companies that talk about it, price matching invariably overcharge. Um, you know, so so the the even though this is meant to be a signal that they're willing to match price, they'll never knowingly be undersold. Um, it it doesn't quite work out that way. Um, and and in and this is why some companies like Tesco um, and uh, uh, Sainsbury and, and and others um, will actually tell you on your shopping receipt what the price would be had you purchased it someplace else. Um, and what companies do is they it, one of the ways they can do this is they purchase daily databases which tell them what their what their what their competitors are pricing. Um, and they may actually use that as pieces of information to signal uh, back. Um, these price cues can also be used for collusive purposes, right? So there isn't, a, you know, there isn't kind of an, an overarching belief that that um, uh, uh, these are really kind of the benefit of uh, the, ben the benefit of consumers. The the main point of all of these things is actually to stop people from searching. Um, and you know, so you can you can be cynical about this and say, well, anything which is aimed at stopping me from searching is probably not going to benefit me. Um, you know, so 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 these types of things, even though the companies will defend them to their dying day, um, are not necessarily associated with with um, uh, with with lower prices. Um, and, you know, so there are all sorts of kind of variations of this which, which operate. And, and the ways in which these things are perceived, the way in which they actually work from market to market are actually quite, uh, quite significantly uh, different. You know, there, there are other things which are kind of related to this as well. So if you, if you think about um, the, uh, the entry models that we talked about and you think about uh, kind of generic prices, um, they're, they're, they're basic or very generic strategies. Um, so if you think about, you know, what they might kind of look like, you, you can you can see four really kind of clear ones. Um, the first is skimming versus penetration. Um, a skimming strategy begins with high price that essentially is reduced over time when pen as the penetration works itself through the market price. Um, so so you 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 more or less kind of work your way down the demand curve. Uh, you don't go for initial high market share. What you do is you 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 work your way through um, through the market. So it begins with a high price, gradually reduced over time. Okay, a penetration strategy does the opposite. What it does is it goes in very low, builds up market share, and then it allows the the the, the price to 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 increase uh, increase over time as customer loyalty is built up. You, you can come up with kind of a logic of when a skimming strategy would work and when a, uh, a a low price strategy would work based upon the, you know, the, the more or less the the, the loyalty of the, uh, you know, the individuals. Um, a skimming strategy is more or less aimed at, at trying to preclude um, competitors from being able to establish themselves in the market. The quicker the 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 uh, the skimming occurs, the uh, less incentive competitors have to operate in that market, um, or they try to rush in very quickly at the very beginning. Um, the low price kind of build market share is based fundamentally on loyalty. Um, and it's also re related to sort of kind of establishing the market share. Um, so when the Japanese, when uh, uh, German automakers came in the US, um, they operated a skimming strategy, started with very high prices, and then over time eroded those prices uh, over quite a long period of time. In the um, uh, in the Japanese case, they came in very much with penetration strategy. You have premium versus economy pricing. Okay, um, you have premium pricing setting up high price when there's a defensible advantage. Okay, 
Um, and again, the the you know many of the European automobile manufacturers operated with the model that model. Um, it, it, you you see this as as well in um, uh, any sort of kind of high high end type of um, of operation. Um, you know, many fashion brands do exactly the you know the same thing. Okay, and this is kind of related to the um, uh, generic types of entry strategies, right? So you've got skimming penetration, premium economy, and then you sort of kind of say, okay, well, what kind of market entry strategy am I really doing, right? Now, is this a lead market strategy or is it a lag market strategy? Okay, so early entry aimed at leading markets where demand and scale can be achieved, okay? Um, and price elasticity is not so great as to allow for price stability and setting reference prices, right? Um, you know, so so your your uh, a lag market is one where you're sort of kind of coming into, you're you're expecting that market to, to uh, operate. Uh, later in 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 the game, okay. So if you look at, for example, what Apple, Apple's strategy in India was to treat India as a lag market, right, um, as opposed to. Places like the United Kingdom, France, uh, Germany, et cetera, where they consider those as lead markets, right? Um, and and part of this, of course, was that the 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 related to their pricing strategy. If you look at that Apple uh, in India, they didn't change the pricing at all. From from in fact, the pricing in India was 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 higher uh, than elsewhere, but it was considered to be a lag market. And then you have kind of big bang versus slow burn. Uh, big bang being entry. Into many different markets, okay. Um, so you you you're trying to gain quick economy of scale, and whereas the slow burn means that you, what you do is you is is, is you enter these markets, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of kind of slowly, allowing them to build up and you know to a greater or lesser extent. So you can look at this and sort of say, okay, well, you know, if I've got a lead market, how am I going to sort of kind of treat that lead market. If I've got a lag market, how am I gonna treat that, that, that lag market? In the case of Big Bang, how again am I gonna treat the market? Now, some of these have certain types of characteristics. In other words, if I'm entering, entering many markets, you know, the, the question is, can I operate with, with multiple pricing strategies, you know, different types of generic strategies operating in different types of markets? So you could look at this and sort of say, okay, well, which of these is really going to be the most relevant one for the markets in which I'm operating? And you could see this in some sense when you look at, at a company like Starbucks, okay. Um, and 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 Starbucks was kind of interesting when you when you look at it, right? So if you looked at the underlying coffee consumption, right, overall you actually see uh, an increase. This goes up to two thousand seven, okay. Um, and if you look at each of the markets, you know some are flat, some are growing, okay. Um, the low income countries. Are very poor, high-income countries, relatively speaking, flat. Uh, developing companies, countries growing, middle-income countries growing, right? And if you look at at, at 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 their internationalization timeline, what you see is you see a whole host of different things which are sort of kind of occurring over a long period of time. Right? Um, different countries being entered, um, you know, uh, operating very, 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 very quickly. Um, and if you look at their revenue versus their store growth, right, um, and you can sort of kind of look at this and say, okay, well, what are their domestic sales, which is sales in the U.S. versus foreign sales? Um, if you look at the foreign sales, right, you know, they're growing, but they're not necessarily flipping out, right? Um, and if you look at the um, uh, domestic sales, right, they're declining as well. Okay, what you actually see is you see uh, pretty much a fairly intensive, fairly fast operation here. So what you see in the case of Starbucks is you see, well, they're not skimming. And, you know, yeah, they are penetrating to a greater or lesser extent. They're, prob they're doing very much a big bang. Okay, um, you know, they're, they're, they're moving out of their lead market first and then moving into what ultimately be lag markets. 
okay, but not completely kind of dog markets that, you know, you don't want to go too extreme, um, but they're not economy pricing, right? So, so basically they're, they're, they're really trying to kind of view it, penetrate, but, but, but at, at a somewhat premium level and to do it in many places at the same time. Um, and, and, and you can sort of see kind of part of the issue which is arising and that is that the markets, the middle income and, and developing countries, which are the ones where you can see them kind of pushing themselves here, right? Because they've gone into all these other markets for the most part over here, okay? Um, all of these are, are developing, you know, Jordan, um, Egypt, Romania, Russia, Czech Republic, uh, many in China, Turkey, Peru, Chile. They're basically trying to capture this this the, in this part of where it is that they're sort of kind of operating, you know, uh, for the for the most part. So it is a bit of a muddled strategy, but but it's very much a big bang strategy, and and it kind of reflects the nature of what it is that they're doing. Um, now there, there's also an aspect of of pricing which is is um, is more dynamic, and and this is kind of interesting in the sense that. That for for many products, um, the 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 pricing is very stable. It it doesn't move around for you know very much, uh, generally speaking. Um, if if you look, for example, at the price of McDonald's hamburger yesterday, you look at it today, it's not going to move around very much. But there are other markets for which um, the the pricing uh, it moves quite a bit. And, and this actually puts bigger demands on the firm to, to, for a number of different reasons. And that is that it's actually got to have justification for the underlying price changes that it's making. So, so if, if I'm McDonald's, I don't necessarily have to justify the pricing of uh, the hamburger. Uh, but if, if I'm operating in other markets where the underlying commodity prices, let's say, or the, the underlying supply pr prices uh, move considerably, then um, I, I need to actually have some justification for this. Um, the, another aspect of this is also related to uh, capacity and, and time-based pricing, which you see in airlines, you see in hotels, um, you see in car rental companies, um, you, you see in all sorts of different types of, of companies um, where the, the pricing uh, in fact can, can, can move very, very, very quickly, okay? and. And this is kind of an interesting area because um, it, it used to be that a lot of this was 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 driven um, by very simple models, and and I can probably tell you a story related to this. And as when I was a graduate student, um, I worked for for a number of uh, statisticians at the University of Chicago, and uh, one of the projects that we 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 worked on, which a consulting project for. Um, a company that ran charter flights. So what they would do is they would run charter flights from Chicago to the Bahamas or Las Vegas or Hawaii, or whatever. And this is the, the days before there were cheap discount airlines. So, so what this company would do is it would, it would basically go to, to somebody like American Airlines or United Airlines. And, and it would literally say, give me three jets to fly on the... 15th of April, uh, one to Hawaii, one to Las Vegas, and one to, to the Bahamas. And uh, it would then market those flights to um, travel agents and tour companies. And, and the, the problem it had is it, 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 is it had to figure out, okay, I've got a jet. The jet holds, I don't know, 220 passengers. How do I price it for those 220 passengers? And, and of course, I can't price it with just one price. So I can't say, oh, it's going to be um, $500 uh, per person. Um, so, so what ends up happening is I, I tier the pricing. Um, and, and I have to make a decision at some point in time uh, when I increase the price or decrease the price. And, 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 and it was kind of ironic in the sense that if, if, if the plane's capacity is 200 passengers, um, this company made money really only on the last 10 or 20 passengers. 
uh, it actually made no money on 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 the others, which meant that if it lowered the price too quickly, it lost a lot of money. Um, but once the plane took off, it, did, it you you didn't want to have empty seats. So so ideally, you'd want to be able to kind of sell, you know, at least sell the last ticket to somebody who would cover your cost, right? Um, and, and not cover the fi fixed cost associated with it, but, but to cover the variable cost of flying them. You know, so, so this, this, this was done literally by us building models after model after model after model, coming up with different demand models to give these managers something on which they can make a decision. Today, um, uh, computer algorithms do this. Okay, so, so the, the, the pricing for the airlines is literally done by the computer algorithms. And, and those computer algorithms not only are looking at um, your purchasing history, um, but they're looking at the purchasing history of all the other people who potentially could come through the door. So they, they you know, so if you go and you're purchasing an airline ticket at a specific point in time, or you're taking a hotel room at a certain point in time, um, it, it's basically going to be a kind of a price discrimination model. So, so ideally that those, those hotels would want to have a model for every single person so that they could figure out, okay, well, what's the price we charge this individual? Um, and and, and this, this can create real issues, okay? Because you can, you can come up with, with um, models um, which are really sophisticated. Um, and, and again, I'll go back to my, 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 my days at University of Chicago. Uh, and this was 30, more than 30 years ago now. Um, and the, the, the thing that was interesting about this was, was we were working with a grocery chain, um, one of the biggest in the, in the United States now. And, and literally we were talking about the ability of technology to price per individual as they went down the aisle, which meant that as you walk through the grocery store, there would be electronic price tags on, on the shelf. And the price you would see and the price the person who was there before you would see would be completely different. Um, so that every product was priced uniquely for every individual. Um, to be perfectly honest, this is absolutely possible to do. Uh, there's nothing that, that, that stops you technically from being able to do this, either from a demand standpoint or from a uh, technology standpoint today. Okay. In those days, it was pie in the sky sorts of ideas, but the, but the main point was that it actually did that. What we ended up doing in those days is, is, is we, would, we would give people kind of ex post coupons or ex ante coupons, which would reduce the price. So they were part of a loyalty program. Um, and, uh, and, and the idea there was we were effectively doing a little bit of this. <clears throat> we were just not doing it in real time. Uh, but generally speaking, this is frowned on in retail. Uh, Amazon tried it, um, you know, literally where, uh, you know, two people going on to uh, the computer looking at the price of something on Amazon um, would see two completely different prices. Um, you, you can see this, in fact, if, if, you, um, if you log on uh, as a different individual on an airline site from a different IP address, um, you actually will see very, very different prices. Um, so you could go on to a, um, uh, I could go on to, for example, United Airlines site, use a VPN, go to the United States. My wife could go on um, to the same site from the UK. Um, I could actually purchase, potentially purchase a ticket for her, which is a different price ticket than she, she would get for herself. Um, so so this, is, this is the issue, right? And what ends up happening in these cases is, is price transparency becomes really quite, quite a big issue, okay? Um, and, and, and in this sense, you're, you're, you're really kind of asking the question, you know, am, am I uh, better off by adding a dynamic component to the pricing 
or am I better off having stability? And there's no indication that I'm automatically better off having stability. Um, you know, that, that, that in the case of the airlines, as an example here, uh, or hotels or entertainment venues, such as sports and things like that, that, that there isn't any real way, shape or form, um, you know, the, the consumers themselves would, would, would necessarily want to see um, that level of stability. So that kind of everyday low price kind of logic, which guarantees the pricing, may not necessarily always, 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 always follow. From a legal standpoint, a lot of this is related to the, to, to uh, uh, clarity as to what it is that's being priced. Okay, um, in multinationals, we use it, um, with, you know, in, in lots of different ways. Um, you know, so they will use it to structure uh, discriminatory pricing. There's no doubt about that. Um, and, but also variability based on location. Um, you know, so, so uh, the stability of the pricing may matter more in certain areas than, than, than other areas. Um, you know, so, so in, in the U.S., there's a you know, phenomenon you know, known as, as couponing, which you see much more than you see in the U.K. and elsewhere, um, where individuals will actively search, uh, will actively collect coupons, will actively look for discounts. Uh, what that means is it means that that potentially raises the prices for other individuals um, in, in that system because those individuals naturally create another segment out there. Uh, what it also means is it means that that the the pricing uh, may not necessarily be as stable in those environments than it would uh, in other types of environments because as more individuals do this, it changes the underlying uh, uh, dynamics, uh, the factors which determine the pricing. Okay. Um, so this is an example here um, where you have different types of pricing, uh, one coming from computer, one coming from mobile phone, um, and the pricing is different. Um, you know, so so it's in this case here, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it's hotels. Um, and and it, the interesting aspect of this is that 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 um, a number of companies um, will exploit this to try and create products which are aimed at kind of resolving this problem. Um, so price comparison sites that you see all the time, um, like compare the market.com and so on that line. These are all uh, related to uh, these types of things. But the, but the, but the interesting aspect of this is the difference associated with um uh just the, just just this this component computer versus mobile phone um it, it becomes even more complicated than that so so with with what the companies are trying to do is they're trying to to to, to fine tune the pricing um around uh the individual in that case and you also then have uh even more complicated types of um uh, uh, models of pricing. Um, you, you have uh, bundling, um, which is a quite interesting phenomenon. Um, you know, so bundling is process of combining a variety of goods together as a package. So uh, you might, for example, bundle your um, uh, television with your mobile phone, with your um, with your internet. Um, uh, aspect. So in Germany, for example, you could you could you could do all of those with Deutsche Telekom. In Australia, you can do all of those with Telstra. Um, you, you you can do those even here, I think, with BP or BT. Sorry. Um, you know, so so the 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 bundling is is sometimes different goods, and it's sometimes characteristics of goods. So one way you can think about um, the products, you know, with a bunch of attributes in them is that the attributes essentially are bundled together. So the normally there's certain characteristics of this. The bundled offer is lower in price than the individual sum of the components. So you don't want people to kind of just kind of bundle themselves. It creates an incentives for purchasers to buy uh, one or another. Okay, so this actually, bundling is a very good way to engage in uh, a posteriori behavioral segmentation. Okay, and this is the key. In, in other words, by offering this mixture of bundles, what you're doing is you're getting people to self-select into, in, into specific types of kind of 
ex post segments. And by doing so, they're revealing something about their underlying demand. Insurance companies do this. Uh, you see it in banking. Uh, it, you see it in anything where if you looked, for example, if, if there were a whole host of potential bundles that could be created, companies don't create all the bundles that can be created. They create a unique subset of those bundles. And that unique subset actually has meaning. It's meant to separate individuals, um, as I talked about in that last uh, lecture on segmentation. Um, when, you get, when you get a separating kind of segmented equilibrium, you're getting it because the, the companies are structuring the bundles. Again, some examples of this. Um, you know, the office product suite was, the, was probably one of the, the most classic examples. Um, the government thought that this was actually anti-competitive. Um, McDonald's, any types of kind of happy meal type of things. Um, you know, the, the, these types of situations here, you know, where um, you're, you're, the seats are actually different. So essentially you can think of this as attribute bundling. Um, and then you have tiering, okay? It's a bundling logic, but with increased service demands, okay? So again, it allows for uh, behavioral segmentation, in this case, on price versus service elasticity. And this is a company called DocuSign, um, <clears throat> which you can look at legal documents or other things. Um, and or, But you could pick up any of these. You could pick up uh, Dropbox, you could pick up Zoom, you can look at any of these and there will be kind of a tiering of these services. What they're doing here is they're basically trying to separate you on price versus service elasticity. And again, it's, it, you know, if you go across markets, the, if, if there's a different price sensitivity, different service sensitivity, I might, for example, offer all of these. And in one set of countries, people choose these, pre, these products and in another set of countries, they choose these products. Um, I might find that in certain countries, nobody chooses those products. Why would I offer those products in that country? For the simple point that what I'm doing is, is I'm, I'm making sure that individuals who could choose this bundle do potentially do have it. But I then don't have to have a differentiated pricing strategy. I can have a global pricing strategy. But it just turns out that nobody in certain countries purchases this. And, and in other countries, they don't purchase this. So when we start taking all of this, you know, onto the international dimension, um, there are all sorts of questions which arise. Um, the, the most obvious is, do I allow for localization of pricing? Okay. Um, and, and a lot of this is related to my entry strategy. So if I'm using exporters and agents, um, you know, they typically control the pricing. Um, you know, it is generally illegal to enforce the recommended retail price. You know, so, so my company, uh, one of the companies that, that I run, you know, we, we export stuff based on orders to, to, uh, uh, to uh, companies, retailers who operate in many different countries. Um, we charge them a wholesale price uh, and they can charge whatever price they want to for the product. Um, you know, we, we have a view of what they should, would potentially be able to charge, but we can't, we, we can't enforce that. Um, what that means is that means is you kind of have this, this, this conflict which arises between the exporters uh, and the uh, agents in the sense that the, the agents obviously want to get the most profit from the product conditional on the underlying cost they, they're, they're paying, which is your wholesale price. Um, whereas the exporter wants to have higher volume. So you do get this, this, this agency sort of conflict between the exporters and the agents. In franchise operations, which talked about quite a lot uh, last week, um, there's a degree of control of price within ranges. But again, you can't enforce this. Um, you know, but, but this is where this kind of global um, uh, reference pricing works. And, and that is that, that the, the pricing is sort of kind of operating within uh, a specific structure. So uh, even though a franchise operator might sort of say, okay, well, you know, if we're, if we're selling McDonald's hamburgers in the United States, we certainly couldn't sell them in Romania for the same price. The, the answer is that that still kind of pulls up the Romanian price. Um, it also allows for local segmentation and adaptation. 
Um, you know, so if you if you sell the product and you put no constraints on the on the um, uh, product mix, um, or in some cases the pricing or even the branding, uh, in, in if it's kind of very generic uh, sort of kind of kind of product, um, you you can you can allow for, for, for segmentation and adaptation to sort of kind of arise in those sets of circumstances. Um, this obviously will have limits depending on the, the spillover between the products and, and markets. If you have direct ownership, you have more control. You know, it's kind of obvious. Um, you, can, you can enforce the pricing structures, which makes segmentation easier, makes positioning easier, okay? But ultimately does have, a, have a, uh, an impact on pricing. You know, particularly if the underlying demand characteristics across the markets is actually quite different. And, and you can see this in example here. The, these are actually approximately the same prices, but this is a, um, uh, a coffee machine, um, uh, kind of mid-level thing. No, this is actually a dual boiler espresso machine. So this is kind of the upper end, which is offered by Braville. Braville is an Australian company. Um, it's offered in countries like Australia and elsewhere as Braville. In the United Kingdom, it's operated as Sage, but if you actually look at it, it's exactly the same product. And in uh, Germany, it's off, off um, uh, marketed as Gastrobac. Um, if, if you look at the, the, the pricing structure, the pricing structure is essentially, essentially the same. Uh, and, and, and in this situation here, um, you know, because of the similarity of the, you know, the, basically the, these these products are absolutely identical. Um, it, it's just kind of the front end with, in the nameplate, whatever the nameplate says. Um, what, what you're seeing here is you're seeing a very very consistent global global strategy. Okay, um, so so even though they they operate under different brand names, they're effectively the same product being offered. Now, when you look at the this is an example. Um, you might sort of say, well, why in God's name do they use Brickville? Why do they use Sage? And why do they use Gastrobac? And the answer is these were all acquired brands. Um, so so Brickville acquired Sage and acquired Gastrobac. But there are actually products within the category that are different. Um, you know, so what's sold in Germany, what's sold in the United Kingdom, what's sold uh, in, um, uh, in Australia. And the United States can actually vary, but not for certain products. And when you look across the products, which are which are the same, these effectively are the same prices, right? But but they're all controlled by exactly the same company. Okay, so so they seem to be able to get away with this pricing structure. And one of the ways that they also get away with this pricing structure, because you could sort of say, well, isn't this isn't this potentially illegal? Well, the the the, the reason that it, that it works is you can actually buy these directly from the company. So by the company operating their own websites, which sell the products directly, um, I think in Gastrobac's case, they don't quite do it. They don't do that, but you can do it with Sage and Braville. Um, they actually do compete against their own retail agents. So if you walked in and you sold and you bought this uh, Sage one in John Lewis, you could also buy it directly from them okay but 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 a lot of this has to do with their 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 much tighter control over sort of the the nature of the process and then you have kind of global uh, uh, price tiering um, you can see this with Mac uh, with with Apple right so Apple takes 30 percent cut on all app store payments um, and the developers actually have to choose a price tier. Okay, so so the this is this is sort of kind of a very interesting structure, right? And that is that if if you look at the price tiers, these price tier the within a tier, right? They are meant to be kind of effectively the same price. Okay, this this is a while back. So one U.S. dollar six yuan, right? One US dollar, 79p, right? So on online, right? Uh, these probably today are closer. But what you do is you let the developer choose the tier. 
But once they choose the tier, the global pricing is set. Okay, and 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 this is this is an attempt on the part of Apple to actually have transparency in the nature of the structure of the pricing that they're that they're that they're doing. Okay, so the the tiers are fixed so to value so that they're roughly equivalent. Okay, but they they typically don't don't try to adjust try to adjust the tiers. Okay, because again, Apple gets its cut; it gets its thirty percent cut. You know, would it rather have you in a higher tier? Well, it depends, because the the you know from a standpoint of any one purchase, yes, sure, it would right. But from the standpoint of how many purchases are going to occur, it effectively leaves that choice up to the uh, the producer. Okay, and and you can see what this implies. So this is an example of Candy Crush Soda. Okay, and these are more or less the revenue differentials. Okay, Game of War, Tinder, right? Skype, right? So, so the 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 price differentials actually are can can be quite significant across countries, right? Um, and and the you know so from from Apple standpoint, you sort of say okay well. You know, if 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 the cost to Apple was fixed, okay, um, you'd want to see more quality associated with this, all right? Um, but they're not actually you know involved. They're only concerned with the price per unit consistency, um, and in this situation here, the differential demand in the different countries it effectively means that they're that that their revenue position in, in, in countries like Japan or the United States or India, uh, Russia are not going to be the same as in Hong Kong or South Korea. Okay, and, and, it, and it varies again, potentially by, <clears throat> by country. Okay, so, so essentially what they do in this situation here is that they say, okay, well, here are all the tiers. Okay, here, you choose the one that you think is, is effectively best for you and we'll take our 30% cut. And, and this actually saves them a lot of grief. Um, and, and what it means is it means that to the extent that the um, uh, companies, like you know, uh, the, the producers of each of these, these, these apps, all right, make an appropriate choice, they force them to actually make that choice across countries. Uh, um, you know, so so even something like Tinder would sort of say, well, we really should probably lower the price in Japan. It should be a different tier, but Apple doesn't let them do that. Right? Um, you know, so so you get these differential effects, and these, these actually do reveal kind of the variations in demand. So so if you allow cross tier pricing to occur, then in the case of Tinder, India. Russia, Japan, potentially the United States would have lower prices uh, than they, you know, than they currently do, effectively because of the, you know the demand, the the demand would 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 be um, would would potentially be lower. Okay, in that regard, it's conceivable they could also go higher prices and sort of say, okay, well, it depends on the elasticity. But 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 essentially, what, what you're doing is you can see see how they would the, would, would play differentially with the prices. But but Apple doesn't let them do that. And and the other aspect which constrains the the, the pricing is this notion of parallel imports. I'll come back to this and talk about it again. But parallel inputs imports occur when firms charge different prices per country. Um, and in in essence, you have a situation where um, the company may restrict the distribution, right? And this parallel or gray market pops up. So the product sold for lower price in, the, in low price country for discounted price gets exported. And essentially the, the company and its own subsidiary has this, this situation. And, and if you look here, I'm just go back to this, this, this Apple example here. If you, you know, I, I have um, 
several Apple accounts. Um, so I have an Apple account in Germany. I have an Apple account in the United States. I have an Apple account in Australia. I have an Apple account in the UK, all of which have to be on local credit cards. Um, if, if I'm using certain apps, they will be mispriced in certain markets, given that I could switch between those markets. So I'm almost like my own internal gray market, which means that, for example, um, I use uh, one app for, um, for indoor cycling. Um, it's cheaper for me to purchase that app from the US app store than it is to purchase it from the UK app store. Um, and therefore I purchased it from the U U US app store. Um, and so, so I'm my own internal gray market, okay? But you could see this in terms of, for example, uh, alcohol or uh, cigarettes or any other situation where the products might spit, go across this market, right? And this creates alternative uh, market price pressure. Now, some countries actually force you to in, to do this. Um, so, so from the manufacturer standpoint, they look at this and they say, okay, well, we don't want this to happen. We wanna be able to charge a higher price. In, in, the, in Australia, for example, and also Canada uh, for many years, there were, there were restrictions on um, selling things like, like CDs, right? So this is before uh, digital downloads. Um, which meant that, that if you bought a vinyl record or you bought a CD um, of the, uh, let's say Bruce Springsteen and you bought it in Australia, it would be significantly more expensive in Australia to buy exactly the same CD as it would in, in, in the United States. Same thing was true of books. Um, if, you, if you purchased a book in, in Australia uh, or Canada, the price was significantly higher. And, and, and this was essentially argued um, uh, in the WTO, um, before the WTO, um, uh, under the General Agreement of Trades and Tariffs, that it was necessary to protect indigenous culture and the indigenous culture in this case, let's say be, being Australian writers, Australian publishers, Australian um, uh, uh music producers, singers, et cetera. Um, and, and what they did essentially is they, they did not um, allow the importation of CDs from the United States or from other places. Uh, but uh, in the 1990s, uh, what happened was, was a complete sea change of the way in which things were thought about because companies were effectively using this as a way of blocking uh, the distribution of cheaper alternatives. So Australians would complain and say, well, why do, why do I have to pay 30% more for a book? Why do I have to pay 30% more for, to see a movie or, or to listen to a CD? And people would literally, you know, come back from the United States and they would have a suitcase full of CDs and uh, at that date case DVDs and, and VHSs and all sorts of things, right? Um, because, it, because it was so much cheaper. Um, and then what ended up happening was the, the Australian government um, and Canadians also went, went a bit the same way, um, flipped and said, no, um, parallel imports are legal. The companies cannot stop a firm from ship you know from from another firm from buying your product in a cheaper country and shipping it to australia and selling it uh, for whatever price it is that they wanted to and and this immediately had a dramatic effect on the pricing of many many main products in australia because you know australia is an isolated country and what it did is it simply overnight just just created all these alternative what used to be gray markets um, but but very quickly became legitimate and legal parallel markets. Okay, um, but companies do this all the time, and and one of the ways they try to protect this is they try to protect this through exclusive distribution. Um, and and the idea on, in this situation is that if you have exclusive distribution globally, then it, it becomes easier to track. If one of your distributors is is, is more or less cheating on you, um, 
but it it is generally speaking um, uh, pretty pretty hard to enforce. Um, exclusive distribution gives you some degree. The problem with this is that is the exclusive distribution doesn't necessarily mean um, that you can enforce legally a contract that says uh, you do not sell this product for export to to a third country. Um, even though you'll see some products which will say, you know, not meant for export. Um, it, it's, it's very, very, very difficult legally to protect that. You also have the, 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 the problem um, associated with uh, exporting, which is um, uh, the, the, the effective uh, explosion of the cost um, of a product um, where you end up having um, uh, price escalation. So this example here shows you how a price can escalate as it moves from, let's say it, it's export base. So uh, a tractor leaves Des Moines, Iowa, okay, uh, at, at 45,000. It has shape uh, uh, shipping as you would expect, but then there are all these additional charges, right? The, the AES filing fee is the export filing fee, um, so you have to put documentation in. So you so you you've got total shipping costs. So what you've done here is you've added four percent here, and then you've you know you add all that up, you've got six percent here. You then add in insurance. Right. This now means that by the time it gets to Yokohama, it's 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 now six point two seven percent higher. They add on VAT, okay, on the additional value essentially here. Um, so so in this situation, um, here you have a an increase here because the U.S. isn't charging VAT, so there's no kind of clawback of that. Um, so the landing cost is now one hundred nine percent. The distributor then takes it, marks it up. The dealer then takes a cut. And by the time you get the product out, it's, it's actually 47% higher than it was in this situation. And, and this is kind of interesting because if you think about, about Brexit, right? This, this, all of these additional costs associated with it, right? Brexit makes this argument sort of says, okay, well, we don't, we don't have um, any tariffs, right? But they do have a VAT charge. If you notice in, in all of this here, none of this is actually tariff. There's no tariffs attached to this, okay? These are just all fees associated with this. And this is one of the real issues associated with, 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 um, with, uh, with exporting. And it's also, if you look here, where, the, where there's a massive increase in the value is when you've got these additional middlemen, the distributors and the dealers who are operating kind of at, at you know, at this level, okay? You know, and, and so if you, if you look at how the difference between sort of kind of well, what, what, what the cost would be in kind of the country of origin, adding in all of these additional costs really, really significantly uh, creates, creates um, an additional burden for you. So you end up with higher higher price leading to lower sales. Less turnover for middlemen actually leads to them demanding higher prices per unit. What this means is it means that 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 the prices effectively have to be higher, okay, or the profit here has to be lower, right? So so the the you know it it's it may be that that when you kind of look at this and say okay well. To be able to sell this tractor in Japan, it's going to sell at sixty-six thousand here. That's an additional one hundred forty-seven percent. That's actually too high a price. Okay, the the only way to actually compensate for that is to lower the price. Who's going to pay the lower price? Well, obviously, part of it may come here, which may mean that the incentive to export actually disappears. In other words, if if if, if this tractor, let's say at forty-five thousand. Can be sold locally. I don't know with some additional markups and a number of other things. Certainly, removing a lot of these costs here. Say that it could be sold for for fifty five thousand um, dollars in the United States. Why would I try to sell it for sixty six thousand here when 
I might actually have to lower my component here. In other words, I might have to charge not a forty-five thousand dollar wholesale price to the to the distributors, but I actually might have to actually cut back on that and cut it back to forty thousand. Okay, so what ends up happening is is this price escalation creates this enormous wedge between the the, the local distribute the local pricing and the global pricing. Okay, and and this is a a, a big issue, right? I, I've left out all sorts of things like exchange rate fluctuations and so on online. Okay, um, and it it creates real issue. It also explains why a lot of manufacturers may want to try and ex cut out this part of the game. Because if, if I, let's say I have an exclusive control of this, this dealer markup, this distributor markup, maybe I can capture that. Why would I pay them $5,000 and $12,000 when I could potentially capture this? In other words, if I looked at this and sort of said, well, you know, all of this, 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 these costs associated with exporting. Can I get a gain from internalizing that? And if I can get a gain from internalizing that, then I could potentially cut this price here down, because any of the gains associated with with the demand increase associated with that, I would capture too. So, so the, the idea that sort of kind of exporting is a, is, is a cheap alternative makes some assumptions about the nature of sort of what it is that this cost escalation effect is. And this is also why um, it, it, it pushes those prices up. So if you remember when we first started talking, we were talking about, okay, you know, uh, what's the, you know, what's, what's the, the, the cost of going overseas okay and you sort of say well that's because that's there, you know there, there, there's good market demand there but the thing you have to recognize is that good market demand to service it is actually significantly higher okay Un unless you could produce all of this locally cut out all of these costs you effectively have start putting a floor on your on your on your ability to engage in pricing OK, and if these individuals here are sort of kind of the, 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 the ones who are sort of thinking about the nature of the pricing, OK, then you have to think about the fact that that, you know, what are, where are these numbers coming from? OK, well, it might imply that that if they're selling locally produced products, they can get a higher dealer markup, which means that, that, that the exporter versus the, the local producer um, is, is under real pressure, you know, because the, the, you could say, well, why don't they just simply say, go to the distributor and say, don't take 10%, take 5%, don't take 25%, take, take 15%. And they'd say, well, actually, we, we don't have to sell these American tractors. We can sell Japanese tractors or Chinese tractors. And actually, we, we will get these margins. Okay, particularly if they're Japanese tractors, if as long as the cost, you know, the, the, these underlying costs are, are lower, Particularly when I'm when they're not paying, they're not being inflated by all of these additional uh, shipping and destination charges and and uh, um, filing fees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So so exporting has this 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 escalation effect, which which affects the minimum price levels associated with it. There's also something which um, you might be really quite surprised by this, um, given. You know, you'd think that, well, you know, we're sort of in a modern environment and therefore we, we you know, we do things very much on a market basis. Uh, there, there's an enormous market for what's known as counter trade. Um, this is a website here, um, this this one here, which is, which is the, you know, is kind of all things to all people counter trade. But counter trade is actually off market trade. Um, it, it, it includes bartering, okay, where you just simply exchange goods. Uh, it includes counter purchasing, where the exporter sells goods or services to an importer, but then agrees to purchase other groups from the importer within a specified period. So there, there's kind of, I buy something from you, you buy something from me. There's an offset where the, the seller assisted marketing products manufactured by, by uh, the buying country. Okay. And then there's buyback, um, where, where the firm builds a manufacturing facility in country 
supplies technology and then agrees to take a certain amount of the output as payment for the contract. The, these are very, very, very big. Um, estimates 15 to 20% of international trade related to these kind of trade agreements. Um, they're very big in defense, they're very big in mining, they're very big in agriculture, um, which means that they're very big in, in countries, um, uh, in developing countries. Uh, they're very big, for example, in the defense industry. Um, if you would look at say something like Boeing or you would look at Airbus, um, you would look at uh, any uh, um, uh, aircraft manufacturing company, um, they, they all actually have these types of agreements. Um, and it's also where there's limited financial liquidity. Again, less developed countries. So you, so if you, you would sort of say, well, what are some of the countries which would have big counter trade? You might expect it in many African countries. You might expect to see it in places like uh, Myanmar, Burma. Uh, you might expect to see it in, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, and in fact, this is where you see a lot of it. Uh, now, what are the pros? Well, uh, they, you know, because you sort of say, well, you know, companies should have advanced beyond this, right? Well, it, it allows for entry into difficult markets. Uh, you know, so so when, when Arm and Hammer was setting up Occidental Petroleum, he basically bartered um, uh, artworks and, and other things um, for licenses. Um, it, it was kind of crazy when you when you thought about it. Um, it increases company sales um, where you might not otherwise have business simply because th they, there may not be the financial liquidity to do it. And it also over, overcomes certain sort of credit difficulties. In other words, I don't have to wait for them to pay me something. I know what I'm going to get. I build a factory and if things work out in the right sort of way, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the outputs associated with that factory. Um, a number of the Belt and Road initiatives from China are actually forms of counter trade. Um, and it also allows for disposal of declining and surplus products. Um, so, so you can get rid of stuff that you wouldn't otherwise have to get stuff that you, 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 would, you, you would do. So rather than discounting the price, I say, oh, you know, I've got a, I've got a number of magnetic resonance imaging machines. They're, they're sort of an old product. You can't sell them in the rest of the world. What I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll give them uh, to, to, to your medical um, system and what you'll do is you'll provide me with X. Uh, you know, there are a lot of cons to it though, okay? Um, the value of the deal is very uncertain. Remember, it, it's all related to the pricing of the bits here. Uh, it's unbelievably time consuming. It's very unconventional. Um, it's very complex. Um, it has very high transaction costs. Um, there are lots of brokerage fees. Um, a lot of things which pop up as corrupt fees, all that money going from, you know, uh, uh, various nations to Swiss bank accounts, almost all of this is related to counter trade. Um, there are logistical issues, uh, and there's also greater uncertainty as the value of the things that are associated here. Um, but in many cases, it's simply the only alternative that you have. And you can see kind of aspects of, of, of how this might pop up. Okay, this is a Boeing, uh, I think this is a 787, uh, no, it's not a 7, yeah, 787, I think. And if you look at, at, at Boeing um, and you look at kind of where are things built and you can see all of these different places, this is their manufacturing in the United States. Okay, so you see all these different places. This is their operations across the world. Um, and the question, of course, is, well, what's going on here? They're, they're basically buying lots of things in lots of different places that they don't necessarily need to buy them. Why are they doing it? Well, here they're doing it because they want to have every congressman known to mankind as part of sort of kind of their, their um, political supporters. Exactly here, they're selling defense, they're selling aircraft, they're selling defense components. Um, they want to be able to sell them to all the right countries, which means that they will have operations in all of those countries. Um, and, and Airbus would be exactly the same, same, same way. You look at various French companies, you look at German companies, I look at Russian companies, they all play this, this game. 
And a lot of it is essentially related to kind of counter trade types of logic. You buy our planes, we'll sit, we'll, we'll manufacture, you know, the central fuselage in India, right? You buy our planes, we'll make the wings um, and the landing gears in Japan. You buy our planes, We'll, we'll, we'll have components which are made in, in Canada and Australia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so let's come back to this transfer pricing because the, the, the transfer pricing is, is kind of the, 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 the most complicated. And when you look at the transfer pricing, this is the case of, of, um, of uh, the a US parent corporation, right? So the U.S. parent corporation is it effectively has a tax liability to the Internal Revenue Service. Okay, so it's 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 creating a report which more or less outlines all of these activities. Okay, and and these these reports essentially um, will outline each set of operations in each country. Uh, that that companies the, the company is using, right? And then it sends that information to each of the tax authorities, right? So so actually this has to match up. <clears throat> but but more or less what 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 you're doing is you're sort of saying, okay, well, what is it that I'm really doing in terms of sort of kind of setting this up? Well, what I'm doing is I'm also I'm, I, I'm, I'm concerned about Let's say the products which might be operating in this in this subsidiary, and products which might be operating in this subsidiary. Um, let's say I manufacture them in the United States and I ship them to these countries, and then they sell them. Okay, uh, what's the price I'm charging this company, this subsidiary? What's the price I'm charging this subsidiary? Okay. Okay. So so there there are a number of things which 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 are used to understand transfer pricing. There's what's known as comparable uncontrolled price. This compares the price of the goods and services in an intercompany transaction to the price ch charged between independent parties. Okay. And in this case here, what you're doing is you're sort of saying, okay, if I make a product and I sell it to some my European subsidiary, then I have I should be selling that product for the same price that it costs somebody to produce it in this in, 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 in the EU. All right. Okay. That's that that may be possible. But suppose, for example, that that product doesn't exist. In other words, the product I'm producing here is sufficiently unique that there is no um, alternative product to this. So you could have something called a cost price percent. The division supplying the goods and services determines the cost of the transaction and then adds a markup. Okay, the markup should be equal to what a third party would earn for transactions comparable situation. Okay, so effectively, this product doesn't exist. Let's say that it's, I don't know, some sort of kind of space vehicle. Um, I send that space vehicle to Europe. What the Europeans do is they say, well, that what's that price? And you say, well, the price is the cost. One hundred million dollars plus fifty-five percent tax or fifty-five percent margin, because that's the appropriate margin. And then they would come back and they'd say, "Well, where'd you get the fifty-five percent?" And they'd say, "Well, there are no other space vehicle companies out there, but fifty-five percent is is kind of comparable to um, undersea." vehicles and that's that's the, the margin on undersea vehicles okay um maybe they believe it maybe they don't there, there's what's known as the resale price which is comparable to this but it uses the gross margin as the base okay um but effectively it has the same problem the problem is you have to have some some comparable okay and then there's what's known as transaction net margin it compares the net profit margin earned in a controlled intercompany transaction to the net profit margin earned by similar transactions with the third party. Okay, um, again, this one becomes difficult if you don't have a third party associated with it. But what what ends up happening is 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 most these things here are, are reasonably artificial. This one here more or less compares 
um, outside, but maybe with another situation. So suppose what happens is I have these subsidiaries, but I'm also selling this product directly, let's say in Africa. Then uh, that would be what I might would use in terms of sort of kind of the net margin here. And then there's the last one is a profit split. And as is by assessing how the profit arising from a particular transaction would have been divided between independent businesses in the transaction. So in this situation here, you're, you're more or less sort of saying, well, if, 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 if the final price of this product is, is 150 million, how much of that is profit? And he's come back and say 75 million. Well, what of that profit would be um, uh, you know, attributable to um, the producer of that product plus the distributor of that product or the producer of that product, you know, except, uh, uh, and the various kind of component production parts of this. And effectively, if you take all of these, what, what they end up being is what's known as economics is higher of, of, uh, of cost or market. Um, it, in essence, you, you know, the, the, the tax authorities will allow you to take uh, the highest of those as the effective transfer price. Okay. Now, different countries do it in, in very different ways, um, you know, in terms of sort of kind of thinking about it. And this is really where the difficulty comes in. And that is that how much do I actually charge? If I'm Apple, and I'll, and I'll use this as an example, how much do I charge my Irish subsidiary for intellectual property? Uh, how much do I charge them for, for um, administrative services, right? et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was, you know, it, because because if, if this is a lower tax environment, then obviously I want to shift the taxes back. And this is what we'll see in, in it, it, when we look at, at, uh, at, at some of the tax avoidance schemes. Transfer pricing for multinationals is, is, is a huge issue. Um, if you see in Brexit, for example, one of the biggest issues that's popping up is the country of origin um, uh, discussions associated with products. You know, whereas in the past, if, if something was, you know, if parts of an automobile were produced in the EU, didn't really matter whether BMW was sending an engine over to be put into a mini um, in Oxfordshire, um, that wouldn't, you know, that, that didn't really matter. But now the UK actually, if they're exporting a mini from the UK to Europe, they actually have to account for where bits and pieces of that came from. What, what that means is that means it's much, much, much more critical um, under the new kind of you know, Brexit situation um, as to how BMW costs that engine when it sends it over to the United Kingdom. Okay, and and you can see all sorts of kind of variations of what what is the the the, the driver of these things, and 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 you can see it's it's basically you know where do the profits get attributed, and where is the the tax, right? So so the biggest issue for for transfer pricing is just simply tax, right? And and. And this is related to the nature of the, the, the uh, transfer pricing. And if you then say, okay, well, what's really kind of important in the, around those transactions, the answer is things like the transfer pricing of intangible property. Uh, in, in other words, how much does Apple charge its Apple subsidiary in Ireland for the use of the Apple brand name? Right? And, 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 you know, that, that's a big deal. How much does it charge Apple for the physical product that it's producing? In other words, that iPhone, how much does it charge for that iPhone? You know, where do the, where do the underlying costs of that iPhone get attributed to in the nature of the production process? So, so all of these types of things become absolutely critical because, because if, if a country forces 
um, a, a, a multinational, for example, to lower the transfer price, it increases the profits of the local subsidiary. Um, if it increases the profits of the local subsidiary, it therefore uh, increases the tax liability of that of that local subsidiary. Um, and that affects that kind of minimum base price that might be attributable to a specific uh, marketplace. Um, so, so from the standpoint of the of the of the multinational, this high variability uh, matters quite a lot. Um, simply because what it might might imply is it might imply um, that the investments or the uh, products that are being sold in a specific country are not necessarily worth the time and the trouble. And these tax uh, controversies, you know, can can be seen in in these examples here. And this will be the last thing I talk about. And that is that you have what's known as the double uh, the double Irish Dutch sandwich. Okay, and it's probably a little bit easier to see in the case of Apple, but I'll, I'll go through this example first, all right? And because this is the Google one. Okay, an advertiser pays Google for an ad in Australia. The money goes to Google subsidiary in Ireland, which holds the intellectual property. Right? So that's that transaction. The tax payable in Ireland is 12%, but the Irish co-pays a royalty to another Google subsidiary in the Netherlands for which it gets a tax deduction. All right, so that's this transaction. Okay. The Dutch company pays the money back to another Google subsidiary in Ireland with no holding tax payable on the inner EU transactions. So it goes back this way, right? And then the last company pays no tax because it's controlled outside Ireland in Bermuda, right? And that's this one here. So, so the the, the tax payable then is actually reduced down to some number, which is less. So effectively you have a company in Australia purchases an ad, the money actually ends up in Ireland, which handles the intellectual property, okay? But the Irish actually deduct from this a royalty payment that's being held by another Google subsidiary in the Netherlands for which the Irish transaction gets a tax deduction, right? That's three and four, okay? So the end up result there is it's actually a lower tax, okay? Um, but the end result of this, of course, is, is it, it all started in Australia. And, it, and this is kind of an interesting one. So for example, if, I, if, I'm, in Den, if I'm in Denmark, or I'm in the UK, let's say, make it, make it simple. And I buy um, a ticket on SAS, on Scandinavian Airlines. Um, I actually, the transaction is, is handled in Luxembourg. Okay. Um, but it's handled in Luxembourg by um, SAS, Ireland. So, so you actually have this kind of interesting set of circumstances where, where the transaction, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a Scandinavian Airlines operation, but the actual transaction isn't occurring in Scandinavia. Um, IKEA, again, people tend to think about IKEA as a Swedish company, but for tax purposes, it's actually a Dutch company. And the reason has to do with the nature of, of, of these types of transactions. So you can, you can see this again, um, in this last example here, where you have, um, in the case of, of Apple, all sales from Europe, India, Africa are actually channeled back to Ireland, which is why you know, people in the EU hate the Irish. Okay, Most of the profits from the sales are diverted to a made-up head office not based in any country. Right? So the Irish profits are extremely low, basically zero. Okay. And these are fees, th these profits are paid back to the US headquarters as fees for research and development. And effectively, this is why you have this very, very, very low, low, low tax. And this is also why Brussels went after Ireland in terms of the, the orders. Now, the question of course is, is, is 
you know, should, should they be paying tax? Um, and if you look on my blog, I make an argument that the, that the simple solution to this is to simply not have the companies pay any tax at all, um, but to enforce the taxes that are paid on dividends at the rates of marginal tax rates of the individuals who were the holders of the of, of the stock. Okay, so so essentially the 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 shareholders pay the income tax and the company doesn't pay the income tax. Um, and they do so directly. So they actually get an imputed income tax related to the profits of the company. The 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 but in this situation here, one question would be, well, where does this money end up? And the answer is it ends up in 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 uh, in, in two places or three places basically. One, it ends up in, in in the productive value chain of the of the company. The second is that it ends up in the uh, pockets of the shareholders by dividends. And the third is that it ends up um, in the lower prices by the consumers, okay? Um, but effectively, it, it's money that isn't going to be paid in tax except for the tax that is paid by the customers who are purchasing the product and the tax that's paid by the productive assets, for example, in terms of income tax of the workers or the income tax on the dividend holders. Um, but the, the other aspect of this, though, is um, that all of this is driven by the differential tax treatments of the different countries, okay? In other words, this is complete arbitrage. There's, there, there's, there's the, the, the big gainers from this are the tax accountants, you know, and the tax lawyers. The, that money is generated because of inconsistencies associated with the tax in all the various countries. In other words, they have figured out a scheme by which they could do this. But the, but the logic associated with the transfer pricing is in theory an attempt to stop this from happening. In other words, that, that according to kind of the, 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 the normal transfer pricing logic, these types of transactions actually shouldn't be occurring. You know, when, when this ad is purchased in Australia, it should not matter whether it is charged to Google Australia that who would end up paying tax on it, or it's charged to Google Ireland, or it's charged to Google in the United States. That's basically the, the you know, the, the you know, the, 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 the logic that in theory is supposed to operate. But the reality is that there are gaps in that system. And what, what happens because of the gaps in that system is that the internal pricing of the components of the product, be it you know, an R&D charge or be it simply a charge for the, for the product you know, to be imported into that country, all of that is actually now kind of part of the complex web associated with the pricing. This is why multinational pricing is so much different from uh, local pricing. Uh, it isn't just a case of, oh, the demand in, in, in China is different than the demand in Germany, and therefore we might have a different pricing structure in China than in Germany, or that the, this, this global segment is different from that global segment, and we might have different pricing for this global segment or that global segment. It, it's also related to the kind of the organizational and legal liabilities associated with the company. Uh, and what that means is that means that you will get these wildly differential uh, profits showing up um, associated with different countries when from a logical standpoint, you know, if you remember your basic economics, um, the marginal profitability in each company, country should effectively be the same. Um, but it doesn't appear to be the same because it has all these tax distortions. Uh, and what that means is that means that, that, that the pricing uh, associated with this um, uh, becomes uh, a little bit more complicated in terms of the nature of what it is that the company is trying to achieve. But at the same time, it also may imply that the company could separate its, its pricing strategy um, from uh, the, the country in which it's located, if in fact it doesn't have to worry about kind of tax differentials uh, in one country versus another country. In other words, it doesn't matter whether one country has a higher VAT than another country does. It can actually use a more generalized pricing strategy because it all gets sorted out kind of in the tangled tax web of the multinational. I know that's kind of a complicated ending to something, but but basically that's kind of a, kind of a fair picture. So 
thank you all and uh, have a good day.